Welcome along to this wonderful, what a lovely way to spend a Tuesday afternoon mm -hmm. in conversation with the fabulous Gugu Mbatharo. Um, now, I was going to give her a big old introduction, um, but she has so much work that we have seen and enjoyed and loved that I would be here most of the afternoon by running through everything. But it's safe to say that um, the wonderful thing about Gugu is just the diversity of work that we've enjoyed um, across both TV and film. Obviously, this is the Royal Television Society who we have to thank for putting this afternoon off. Um, so thank you very much to them and thank you to you guys for joining us this afternoon. And Gugu, welcome. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much, Edith. And thank you, uh, Royal Television Society. This is, um, this is such a treat. Thank you. Do you ever kind of give yourself the chance to, to just reflect for a moment and to think about what you have achieved up to this point? Do you ever get that opportunity or give yourself the opportunity or is it weird? Yeah, I mean, I, I try to reflect after every job. I think that, you know, getting to do these really intense experiences you know just kind of coming back to yourself and be it just sort of I always call it re-entry a bit <laughs> a bit like when when you see in sort of uh, space movies you know when they've been in space and then they come through like the Earth's atmosphere and and they're shaking and sweating and, and then they kind of like come back and they're like oh yeah we're back you know I always feel like that when I'm I finished a job where you know you're always a bit wobbly afterwards and then and then the reflecting you know and you kind of have to sort of I don't know you have you can't just keep going but um but yeah so I do take that seriously I think it's really important because otherwise you just you know kind of burn out and you know yeah um you know can't have perspective on on what to do next but um but yeah it is funny seeing all of that you know smushed together and I do <laughs> realize wow in a conversation like this I have done so much <laughs> um and I think the pandemic was a great moment for you know everybody to reflect in a way forced reflection you know so yeah so I've definitely probably done a bit more reflecting in the last year or two yeah that's really interesting. You sort of the way you describe that kind of um, re-entry because it gives us an insight into to how much you put into your roles, how much you know you kind of almost sacri sort of, you know sort of sacrifice yourself, but how much you put into it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's 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 not really something that, that that many people talk about, but it's it's hard work, isn't it? It's there's a lot of prep, and the actual work is is enjoyable. It's something you love doing, but it's hard work. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I love it. And I think I suppose when I make, make, use that sort of reentry sort of space movie metaphor, it's it's that idea of you really are in this bubble, you know, yes. and, and I think that as an actor and certainly probably more so in film and television, you, you're in such a such a machine and and there's such a clear hierarchy and and it's you know, you know, your role, you know, your lines and, and, and the, the, the rules of the world are sort of set uh, in a way that is sort of comforting and much more um, much more sort of so than than the real world in some ways <laughs> you know so so there is a, a comfort in that in that play world and I think you know I'm sort of often sort of trying to get back to that you know because it is it's almost like being in a sort of a flow state you know you, you yeah you when you really are loving what you're doing you know you're just trying to get back to that state however however you can you know um so so that's really how I've I've kind of looked at it. Yeah. What age were you when you kind of made that decision or you had that inclination that that this was a path that you wanted to take? I think it was probably when I was 11 and I played Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, which awesome. uh, <laughs> it actually wasn't The Wizard of Oz. It was actually The Magic of Oz because I don't think that my local drama group actually had the um, the sort of real rights <laughs> Was. So my drama teacher rewrote a version that was sort of a combo of the Wizard of Oz and the Wiz and a few other things. Um, but it was still Dorothy. And, um, and doing that uh, was, was an amazing experience. I mean, it really was my first 
role on stage I I danced you know I'd done sort of tap and jazz and lots of and pantomime and you know all sorts of things that you do as, as a child in England yeah. realizing people if they're not in in the UK might not understand the the sort of beautiful culture of pantomime <laughs> that we have in all its strangeness in the UK um but you know it's something that you get into as a, from a very young age as a child in terms of theater and uh and I think doing Dorothy I just um I just found so much joy in it. And I, I knew I wanted to perform somehow. And I, and I loved musicals and I loved musical theater and stage. So, so I feel like it was around 11 that, that I felt like, oh, this feels good. I, I really want to explore this more. Um, and then really in my teens, um, you know, playing around with youth theater and musical theater and, and finally sort of ending up applying to drama school um, when I did my A-levels. Was it a point where you, felt like an actor where you were like yeah I'm 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 doing it I am um, you know um I I don't know I suppose uh you know early on I knew I was sort of in trouble when I was doing National Youth Music Theatre and I was <laughs> uh, you know I had a tiny part in um Into the Woods by Stephen Sondheim and yeah. done it all in the summer holidays and I was understudy for Rapunzel um and I was playing Cinderella's mother, which is a very small part, uh, but I got to go on as uh, um, Rapunzel actually got sort of ill and I got to go on a few times and um, and at the end of the summer holidays, um, I remember standing there singing, we we're all singing Children Will Listen, which is a very emotional Sondheim song and, mm -hmm. and I was just bawling my eyes out, it, it just bawling my eyes out on stage because I knew I'd had an amazing experience and it was the end and, and I thought, oh, I don't know. I just, I just knew that that was a very big moment that I was going to shift and, and you know, thought, okay, I have to get to drama school. I have to figure this out because I, you know, just, just fell in love with the whole thing and and the whole company and everything. So, so that was a big shift. And then, of course, like getting your first job is also, you know, when someone's actually yeah. paying you to do it is is another sort of another thing. What was that first job? I um, played Celia in As You Like It, Shakespeare's As You Like It, um, in an open air production of, of As You Like It in Exeter. Uh, yeah. So it was it was not a very glitzy, high profile piece of first work, but it I was so excited to start my career with Shakespeare. I think coming from a three year drama course at, at mm -hmm. RADA, um, I left a little bit early because I got this job and um, yeah, Celia, if anybody doesn't know the play is sort of uh, Rosalind best friend and and so she's um you know a very sort of playful character and um yeah it was it was it was great it was as I say open air in the sort of college gardens and and I'd grown up going to see um open air Shakespeare in Oxford uh, which they often did in the college gardens um where, where I wow. was a teenager so so that was sort of probably some of the first Shakespeare I saw was in a, a university college quad in Oxford so to have that as my first job um was quite meaningful. How important has has the theatre side of things been to to your journey um as an actor? Oh huge really I feel that Theatre really was everything for me. I mean, that's where I got into acting um, and beyond act, well, before acting, it was dancing. And I think it was just a mode of expression, self-expression mm -hmm. and after school clubs and youth theatre in the summer holidays. And, um, and I think sort of being an only child, being able to kind of go to my drama group and hang out with my musical theatre friends was just, such a joyful experience and mm. um and just hanging on to that I think going into drama school I think there's a sort of um you know you feel like you, you I felt like I found my tribe with with theatre people and you know the, the sort of play and the mischief and um and just the sort of eternal childlike quality that that a lot of um theatre actors need and have um so so really theatre was everything for a very long time for a lot of um, UK um, audience, Belle would have been their introduction to, to your wonderful talents and, and what an extraordinary film, what an extraordinary woman, what an extraordinary character. Um, and I wonder if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about 
that film, um, the, the the process of of making that and taking on the sort of of Dido Elizabeth Bell, and yeah. also just what it was like working with Ama and and how important that role was for you. Yeah, it was. I mean, on re talking about reflection, I mean, on reflection, like you say, I'd, I'd worked so much, you know, and, um, until, you know, before that, that role came along. But actually, I, I was aware of Belle and I was aware of the film for nearly sort of seven or eight years before it actually got wow. made. Um, <laughs> uh, wow. When I first left drama school, I... I had a sort of general meeting with the producer of the film um, who, who mentioned it to me, um, you know, and, and I remember going to um, to um, Kenwood House and, and, you know, looking for some evidence of Belle. And I found a postcard in the gift shop of, of the painting, um, but, there, but, but the painting was up in, in Scotland with the, with the family at Schoon Palace. So, um, so yeah, I, I remember sort of, having this postcard and hanging on to it and I'd you know read the early versions of the script and you know it wasn't it was originally Belle and Bette it was sort of this the, the two the two sisters and uh I don't know it just captured my imagination I think because I was living in North London at the time and and I used to sort of walk on Hampstead Heath you know mm. um at the weekends and just it just really inspired my imagination because I just sort of thought wow you know in, in that time in that time period Dido Bell probably walked in, the, in these woods or you know yeah. who knows where she was but but you know just be I just really felt a connection somehow and um I was sort of fascinated by the fact that she was a, a biracial aristocrat and mm. such an unusual story I just found it so refreshing because I'd grown up on all these Jane Austen and adaptations you know but never really seen a character that looked like me in them yeah. so um so yeah and then and then you know a few years later you know you I sort of always had it in the back of my mind and I was working and doing other things and and then I remember I first met Amma actually for a completely different project um which she's since made but this was many years before Belle um a film called Where Hands Touch mm -hmm. um that she was looking to direct and and again, the nature of the film business and, and independent film, you know, so often timing and financing and all sorts of things. So I met her for that and then it didn't happen at that point. Um, but then she became attached to Direct Bell. Um, and uh, so that was, you know, sort of serendipitous that we'd already met for something else. And um, yeah, and it was just, it was just a really incredible experience. I mean, I, I was working in America. I'd been working in America, I think, for about three years by the time the production was ready to go. And I kind of thought, oh my gosh, can I, I've been playing Americans, doing an American accent and, and going back to do this sort of quintessential English rose, uh, you know, I thought, can I, can I act in a British accent anymore? I can't remember because it's been, it's been so long, you know, so, so it was kind of a funny moment to kind of you know, <laughs> go back in and, and do that, even though, you know, probably from other perception, it looked like maybe Belle was what brought me to America, but actually I, I'd already been there doing, doing TV and, and theatre um so yeah it was it, and and then you know just the meaning of the film and and you know that it continues to to touch people and you know all of the things that it brings up around race and class and gender um you know I'm incredibly proud of of its journey you know it feels like um in some ways you know a, a pioneer for that for that genre you know in a way like 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 Belle was herself in in some respects does there does there come a a, a slight weight of responsibility when you are playing a real person because you you kind of repeated that with misbehavior uh you know with the role of 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 uh of jennifer miss grenada who yeah. i i know that you you spent time with which is a what i guess is a wonderful opportunity to be able to do that to really yeah. find the essence of her yeah it really it really is i mean it's a it's a funny thing i think playing a real person at least at least with Belle, she wasn't around to watch the movie, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> so if, if the ghost of Dido Bell doesn't like my performance, I, I, I won't know, you know, unless, unless she wants me. But, um, but you know, with Jennifer Hostin, um, who, you know, is in her 70s now, um, she really is very much alive and um and I think there is a slight different pressure when when the person's around um and 
you know, I think with Misbehaviour, it was just such a joyful script and uh, such a, I couldn't believe that it was a true story because the collision of the events were just seemed, you know, sort of stranger than fiction. You know, the idea of the first woman of colour to win Miss World, you know, happened in the same year that the, the Women's Liberation Movement stormed the ceremony. I mean, so, so much drama just in those two events happening at the same time. Yeah. And, um, and Jennifer Hostin um, was very very generous uh with her time and um i actually went to meet her in grenada um which was sort of a slight stretch of a research project because um because uh you know i none of the film was sh shot in grenada but she's such a national treasure there and i just thought i can't hold my head up and play miss grenada if i haven't been and especially as all the, the film is set in in London so um so we met there and I took my mum and she brought her awesome. daughter it's a bit of an experiment really of a holiday to kind of go on a holiday but also you know do some research for a film and um and she was so generous with her time and you know talking about you know listening to her accent you know which is quite unique and um and just sharing her reflections and perspectives on on that time was was really invaluable and and the first time I watched the film actually was with her which I will never do again oh, wow so nerve-wracking <laughs> But, um, but was with her and her daughter and son who were, I was like sat behind just like this, just <laughs> terrified um, of their reception. But but she she loved it. She's, you know, she came to the premiere, which we had um, right before um, things shut down in 2020, unfortunately. But, um, but it was, you know, it's wonderful. And we email and, you know, I was just in Canada and, I'm still friends with her family. I feel like I've sort of joined the family as some sort of right. you know extended cousin or something. So um, so yeah, that luckily that that really did work out in terms of having you know um, a real person that was also on board with the project and and happy with with how it turned out. But you never know. Yeah, I I, I guess that's a lovely kind of um, element to it. To to so much actually of the work that, that you do is that. Yes, it's it's a piece of entertainment, but with a lot of it, there is a, a you're shining a light on a on a person or a situation or a situation that needs to be talked about that needs to be mm -hmm. explored. And I think that that's wonderful when you look through so much of your work that it's doing that. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, for me, that's always a bonus. You know, I think it's it's acting is great fun and what I loved in my teens, you know, the joy and the, and the play of it all. But mm. I think what brings it to another level for me is, uh, you know, a story that, that needs to be told, a story yeah. that maybe is a new perspective that we haven't seen before. Um, or, you know, even with with something like misbehavior, you know, that the, the through line of activism is quite, quite overt there with, with um, you know, obviously the, the women's livers, but, but, you know, the idea of, of how you can sort of change people's hearts and minds with storytelling yeah. and how that sort of opens, opens up conversations. Yeah. Now, prior to us um, doing today, I hadn't seen Beyond the Lights, which I went and watched and I loved so much um and it's just it's another you you are this just kind of polymath where you know these roles throw up so many different aspects of you as an actor and the talents that you have and you you know you kind of play a Rihanna character in this yeah. film really to yeah. be honest you know proper all singing all dancing the kind of the the and it's a brilliant story you know your your mum played by Minnie Driver in it and I just thought it was absolutely fantastic what was the appeal for that specific project for you in terms of taking on the role of Noni yeah I, I really it was Gina Prince Bythewood the writer director who um you know is well known for Love and Basketball A Secret Life of Bees um, and uh, she recently did the old guard with with um, uh, Charlize Theron, which was a huge smash on Netflix. But she's she's written and directed her own things for many years, and and she had this very interesting take on 
the idea of misogyny in the music industry and and you know there, there were so many again there was another level to it I think for me because obviously on on the one hand I was like wow wouldn't it be fun to play a pop star I mean isn't that everybody's kind of fantasy you know to to be able to do the singing the dancing and and be part of that world but I think that also the sort of message that Gina had underneath it all mm. um was really fascinating to me you know the idea of how young artists are hypersexualized in in pop and hip hop and how that you know at the time that she was writing it um and she took a lot of inspiration from um Alicia Keys and and a few other artists that that were sort of really writing about their their experience in the music industry that yeah. that that sort of hypersexualization seemed to be sort of the only you know the packaging uh, um and the only way for people to sort of break through above and beyond their talent and that they weren't you know this was sort of pre uh, you know Adele or or anybody that that was you know really authentically writing their own songs and and um and the difference between you know, being able to be um, an artist in in the pop world, but also how how do you hang on to your authenticity? And yeah. I think that authenticity is, you know, a word I would just use to describe Gina. I mean, we she really put me through my paces in terms of the research and the the dancing and the singing. And we went to the Grammys, you know, that year that we were preparing and went backstage and worked with real music producers, you know, who'd worked with Rihanna and Beyonce and those kind of artists. Wow. So. So, um, so it was a really immersive experience, the way that she sort of saturated me in that world. And I think, um, you know, it wasn't an easy film to get financed initially. I think that the studio did want a sort of Beyonce to play the role or, or a re an actual pop star. And, and Gina really stuck by me because she said, no, that's not the point. You know, we need to be able to... Yeah see this character and and not be distracted by their real pop persona you know alongside it but really go into this character and and understand you know the psychological effects of fame and yeah uh, you know, with with somebody that we don't know already as a pop star so yeah so yeah it was um it was an incredible experience and I think doing that I I did that the year after exactly a year after Belle and you know and it was it was such a fascinating sort of um experience really to you know go from working with Amara Sante on a period drama in the UK yeah. to, to then working with Gina you know on this very contemporary um film in LA you know it was just such a wonderful sort of breadth um, um of work that year which um you know was really special. I really kind of um admire how she wasn't scared to kind of go there both in mm. terms of the scripts and the subject matter, but also with your performance as well. I just thought it was, um, yeah, I thought it was brilliant. Okay. So great. And yeah. um, female directors you're talking about there, and then on the com complete kind of flip of that, with something like Motherless Brooklyn, which I mm. thought was incredible as well, and working with with Ed Norton, who, yeah. you know, not only directing the film, but but starring in it as well. Um, what was What was that experience like for you on, on that film? Oh, you know, that that project, I mean, that just really felt like a movie movie. I think there was such there was such a sort of I think because it it was, you know, I love New York and I've always wanted to work there on, on film. And I'd, I'd done um, Irreplaceable You there, you know, the year before, which was a very small budget um, sort of romantic drama you know but to then go to motherless brooklyn which you know is just this epic noir and uh you know just that period the 50s uh, Brooklyn and obviously Edward Norton, um, an actor that I've respected for so long uh, with his incredible career and performances that he's done. So, so it was a really cool experience. And I think, you know, it, there were so many heavyweights in that film. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I felt like I was sort of one of the only- You're a heavyweight that... now, Googie. <laughs> Come on, you're definitely represented for the girls with a heavyweight in there. Thank Surely you, Ed, thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just um it was a wonderful experience I think especially to work with a real actor's actor um you know Edward is quite cerebral he he'd adapted the book um himself it was his script he'd been wanting to make it for 10 years so it, there was a real sense that it was a passion project and um and I just loved the detail of the production and um and sort of all of the nuances and and as I say just working in New York which was just 
so inspiring. And then also working with an actor who is directing you at the same time, which, you know, I'd done really early on with Larry Crown, um, which, you know, yeah. Tom Hanks, you know, which was quite a sort of starry way to go straight into, you know, working with an actor director. But, you know, then a few years later, a very different genre with, with Edward Norton. Um, you know, being sort of in character on the one hand and, you know, in costume. I think that's always the funny thing that you sort of forget that when you're getting direction from an actor, you know, they're still in their costume, you know, in there with the trilby and the outfit and then stepping behind the camera and, and giving you notes and everything. Um, but, but I think that, you know, it made it feel like a real actor's, you know, a character piece, which was, which was really special. Yeah, if you haven't seen Motherless, Brooklyn, I highly recommend that, that people go and watch it because it's great. And before we move on to TV, I've got one more film, please, that I'd love to talk about, <laughs> which is Summerland, um, oh. which I thoroughly enjoyed. And I thought Jess Will did a beautiful job with that film on yeah. so many levels. And that's a relationship that uh, started back in theatre, I believe, as well with, with, with Jess. Yeah, Will. with my first job, with Celia yeah. in As We Like Whoa. It. Ta-da, full circle. Um, yeah, we, we met um, Jessica Swale, um, who directed uh, and wrote and directed Summerland, was assistant director on um, As You Like It at, at Exeter. And she just left Exeter University and I just left RADA. And we met on that theatre job and just sort of bonded. We, we just, you know, became the best of friends and uh, worked together. Uh, um, and then, you know, we kept track of each other's careers Careers and Jess was doing theatre and I would you know I ended up doing um Nell Gwynn the play that she yeah. wrote at the Globe you know and in between that there were many sort of theatre readings and projects and we would just always bounce ideas off each other you know of our journey in the industry so when Summerland came along um I was so excited to be a part of it uh, her first film with Gemma Arterton and and such a, a fun role and um such a British story and such a sort of you know a refreshing take on it on a period absolutely of story, you know and um and for me um you know being able to be a part of that was just very meaningful I think because we'd known each other for you know over 10 years in the industry um and then to be able to sort of see your friends and not just your friends your peers and your generation kind of rise and and be a part of sort of becoming the net the new establishment or the new the new people so it's sort of you know actually making the projects you know as opposed to you know auditioning for them or uh, was was really um really just such a satisfying experience is it is it uh, a clear difference for you where when it, the, when it's a female or male director it, it, or is it just down to the person to me they're just the director I I, I have to say I, I, I have worked with so many female directors that you know as, as Amara Sante always says you know they are not a monolith you know female directors are not <laughs> yeah. a monolith and and like like any director nobody wants to be sort of um labeled under that umbrella Every, you know um Gina Prince Bythewood, Jessica Swale, Amara Sante I mean such different personalities such different life experience such different storytellers yeah. um and so so for me at this point, you know, obviously, you know, there's still a long way to go in terms of equality in our industry um, across gender. But um, but for me, it really is the director I'm working with. And um, I think everybody has such a unique vision. Um, oftentimes, um, female directors that I've worked with will you will find that the focus of the story or the point of view of the story is is more from the female gaze um you yeah. know and, and the roles maybe are that much more nuanced in some some respects but but beyond that um you know there's there's really no um difference in terms of how I approach the work yeah I mean that's a really good um kind of lovely seamless link into Loki to be honest and Kate Heron mm. and how you know, amazingly, obviously it's about Loki, but all these brilliant female characters that kind of revolve around the storyline and Judge Lenslayer, just what a great character. Yeah. Um, what was your what was your expectation on kind of stepping into that Marvel world? 
Yeah, it's it's so interesting because it's um, you know a world that I'd sort of tiptoed around the edge of, um, and I think um, like you say, and for many reasons, you know, or, or maybe I felt like they, it was more of a male centric world, um, uh, and the superheroes that I was that I was seeing coming out of that um, that genre um, for a long time. But I think being able to work with Kate Heron and also being able to take on a character like Renslayer, who mm. is complex and um, and she's not sort of uh, the sort of superhero chick, you know, she's she really is. Um, well, she's kind of you know the the bad the bad guy, you know, which which I sort of really Fun. relished as <laughs> yeah. a kind of uh, as as a sort of challenge and also you know a, a departure from so many of the roles that that I've done so so for me you know being able to sort of and she's she's also not just um you know like a, a sort of stereotypical villain I feel like she she keeps you guessing you know yeah and and, and her moral compass is is a little bit more gray I think um which which was kind of fun to also bring some some layers and some nuance into you know what is essentially you know a, a baddie kind of character so I so I thought I'd have fun with that and then like you said knowing that Kate Heron was going to direct all six episodes um and uh you know that it had such a British feel to it as well so many Brit actors there obviously not just Tom Hiddleston but um Wumi Masaku and Sofia Di Martino um you know and and then Kate of course so so you know it really felt like um a real Brit squad yeah <laughs> Clearly, you can't tell us anything about the second series. No. <laughs> <laughs> you literally... so there, there is going to be one, obviously, but that's that's not news. But um, but no, I mean, actually, I don't know too much about it even. So so it's not even me withholding uh, information. Luckily, <laughs> I, I I I don't know too much about it. Yeah. I almost I almost imagine anyone who's involved in, in Marvels, they, they have a constant Marvel companion who at any point where they say something they're not, it's almost like a hand comes across <laughs> the mouth. It's like, nope. I know the Marvel, not to say the Marvel police. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I know. They're just always lurking. Um, but you, no, but... You, yeah, you've been involved in some, you know, uh, the, the, the line, gone are the days where TV was one thing and film was another. Mm. The line between the kind of two in terms of the production levels and the, the depth of storytelling um, is, is gone, really. And you've worked on some extraordinary TV work. We just talked about um, Loki and, and things like Black Mirror. I mean, that episode that you were in of Black Mirror, I think, is, is, is one of the best. I just thought it was there were so many fantastic things about that, whether it's um, Clint Mansell's score, the performance and just the whole production of it and the production design of it. I just thought it was was amazing. What was the appeal for you to 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 that particular script and and being part of that Black Mirror world? Oh, San Junipero I, I, is <laughs> such a special one. And I have admired Charlie Brooker for a long time. I think he's just got such a brilliant I for you know satire and that that dark um storytelling that always reminds me of sort of you know your tales of the unexpected sort of raw dark, <laughs> yeah. sort of dark twisted but you know really very very true and yeah. um and uh yeah when I read that script I I just I read it all on my phone actually which is very Black Mirror in some ways uh, because I sort of just started reading it on a bus uh, in London and and I was going to sort of read the first couple of pages and then you know put it down and, and read it on my laptop when I got home and then I just read the whole thing because it was just so compelling mm -hmm. and the twist in it just you know literally made me go what you know it was it was it really shocked me but also moved me and um and I just thought it was so uplifting and and the message was so you know sort of lovely and 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 I just loved also the vivid the vividness of how I you know it was captured you know in terms of that 80s feel um so nostalgic and fun and um it's just so refreshing so so for me um you know to be a part of any Black Mirror you know I'm really glad that that 
that it was that one in a way because I feel like it sort of captures my personality as well that character you know her energy you know and that sort of vivacious sort of spirit is is probably much closer to me than than some of the more intense roles that, that I've I've played so so um so yeah that was just such a joy is that harder playing a character that's closer to yourself though than or uh, well I don't know I think it's like anything I think ah, uh, you know I after um that that it depends what I've done before I feel like yeah. before I did San Junipero I had done I can't remember exactly but some quite intense roles and and there yeah. was something about having you know I had I remember feeling like I had all this repressed joy to express you know and I and I went and did um Nell Gwynn on stage and then I did uh San Junipero straight after and um and somehow I feel like it sort of sort of balanced me out a bit you know to be able to go from these you know really um sort of you know traumatized characters to a, a very joyful character um yeah was was really um fun and also as I say just sort of felt like the right next thing to do so so yeah I don't know I mean I feel like there's a part of me in every role you know and I obviously you know to be able to connect with the character um but uh yeah I, I think it just depends what I've just done you know yeah. as to as to whether it feels like um more of a challenge um mm. or more of a stretch you know um I love the morning show as well I just thought it was um have you have you watched the second series yet? I mean, I'm still working Hannah's my way still through present. It. Yeah, She's still ever present. <laughs> yeah, it's it's strange watching it. You know, uh, it's sort of like sort of hanging out with your mates. You know, like watching it now, knowing all the cast and uh, well, obviously there's new characters in the second season, but um, but knowing that world um, and it was it was such a special one to be a part of. You know, and that character's journey um, was really so well written I mean Kerry Erin the, the showrunner of and the writer of of um the morning show just so skilled at how she really captured those that situation you know and and that journey for Hannah um was really it was such a powerful storyline that that I really was you know it was really important um to me and um you know people's response to it has been um really special that it, that it's it's contacted people you know which is um, yeah yeah doesn't always happen so yeah and also seeing your contemporaries you know working you'd worked with Reese before but but you know through her this came through her production company and seeing women who are front of camera suddenly take control and be part of that world and that must be really inspiring for you because it's mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a journey that you're now taking as well yeah, it's hugely inspiring. I mean, you know, Reese Witherspoon, obviously with Hello Sunshine and everything that she has built um, mm. with her company and as a producer, um, I really look up to her. And, you know, it's been amazing going from working with her as, you know, in, in A Wrinkle in Time, for example, as, yeah. a, as an actress alongside her, and then and then to work with her, you know, as, a, as an actor producer on The Morning Show. And then, you know, this last year, I've been working with, with Hello Sunshine as an actor, executive producer myself self mm -hmm. on a uh, surface you know so it's kind of surreal to sort of see that that sort of journey and be a part of that journey and as I say be inspired by powerful women that are also empowering other women I think that's that's the really um wonderful thing about how Hello Sunshine works is um you know it's it they and it's not just all for one one actor or one actress you know they are there to bring you know um help you grow into those roles and I and I think yeah. that's been really um a, a great experience this this year sort of finding my voice as a producer and um looking at you know looking at my performance looking at the show looking at the context of 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 the show I think when you're acting you're obviously so close to the role you need yeah. you know you need to be so close to the role but I think there is um been something really interesting and educational for me about sort of looking at the whole and and getting a different perspective um on how shows are made and how hard it is <laughs> and how collaborative yeah. it is um but you know what what um you know just taking a, a different viewpoint on on storytelling um has been great 
Well, one of the shows that you have been uh, involved in is is what we can we can watch you in at, at present. It's on uh, it's on the iPlayer at the minute. If you haven't watched the girl before, fantastic four piece uh, drama, and it's going to be on the states uh, available in the states uh, first week of February, I believe, as well. So tell me, because you 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 know you're, you're not just playing Jane in this in this in this show. Yeah, the girl before came to me. Actually, I was doing Loki. Um, we were just finishing Loki in 2020 and I, I got sent um, the first two scripts of The Girl Before. And uh, I remember being really intrigued at that point because there were two, seemingly two female leads, uh, Emma and Jane, which I thought, wow, this is, this feels really complex and um, sort of twisty, you know, sort of a keep you guessing kind of thriller, but also there's more than one great female part, you know, which, which initially sort of caught my attention. Um, and then uh, I was invited to be an associate producer on the project, um, and I was the first person cast and and that was really wonderful um 42 the production company you know were just so inclusive about bringing me on you know into the sort of writing zoom meetings and the script yeah. development of the, the the next two episodes and then the casting process obviously this being quite a unique casting challenge uh for amy hubbard our casting director um because obviously the character of emma had to have a resemblance to me you know so that was already sort of set um and then you know being a part of bringing david e. yellow on, on board um who so i've worked good. With for he's wonderful isn't he i mean he's just um you know and this role is such a departure for him um in many ways i think um you know he brings such a gravitas and an elegance to everything that he does but there's there's a darkness to this character that i think you know people might not have seen him do before you know and knowing him as i do i thought he'd really relish that um that challenge um so so yeah so so that was really you know um a new experience and all happening in lockdown you know which is kind wow. of funny doing a story about a house um and we're on we're on zooms you know developing the scripts about the you know the weirdness of how a house can kind of get to you you know and we're all in our houses <laughs> um a lot of parallels there you know um but um but yeah it was a really a really special experience and and i think really special for me to be working back in the UK you know we filmed in Bristol and um having been in the States you know with Loki and, and the last few projects um to be able to come back for the first time on a, a BBC show a very British show um, and be the lead you know just it just felt sort of like a, a homecoming of sorts and and uh you know a really special challenge. How far do you want to take that journey um behind the camera is do you have do you have dreams to to write and direct and you've been part of the writing process for the show yeah you know I'm sort of like one step at a time I really yeah. respect every role you know and I think I've come to appreciate how hard producing is and how hard directing is you know I think I would never just flippantly say you know oh I'm gonna just turn my hand at this but but I um you know, I really enjoy the producing process, I think. Um, I think there's certain things that sort of go hand in hand a little bit, you know, more so maybe like actor producer, I, I really, mm -hmm. um, I could see myself, you know, doing that or, you know, taking more of a, a hand in developing projects from an earlier stage, be it from books or articles or, you know, looking at how yeah. you bring, bring a project to life. Um, and uh, we'll see. I, I, I like sort of working with writers and um, uh, but again, you know, from working with writer friends of mine, again, it's such a, a solitary you know pursuit in many ways writing and I I'm not sure that's my personality I love the collaboration and bouncing off yeah. people um so so we'll see but I you know I hope to you know continue growing as as a producer um well I could talk to you all day as you probably <laughs> tell but we, I do need to get some of these questions lovely questions coming in from people so yeah. thank you so much okay. um first one is from Brandon Hughes who says how do you choose your roles and do you ever well, I've just asked you that, see yourself directing, but what's the decision making process on on roles? Because I'm assuming that by this point as well, you you're not you don't need to audition for stuff anymore. Yeah, I mean, I audition occasionally. I, you know, I, I think it's um, if it's if it's something very, very different to anything I've done. Um, but I've been very lucky the last the last few years to have, have you know, 
had a few offers, you know, which have kept me busy. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, how do I choose? I, it's very much instinct, I think. I have to say, you know, I can usually tell the first sort of 10 pages of a script, sometimes sooner, you know, the quality of the writing, you know, and um, and the point of view and, and the character. And then and then really it's it's who is it with, you know, is it is it a director I'm excited to work with? Is it a genre that maybe I haven't done before or haven't done recently? Um, what's not just what's the story about, but what's the message of the story? That's a big, big thing for me as well. Um, you know, um, is it gonna sort of, bring some positive vibes to the universe as it were but you know is it gonna is it gonna you know either create a conversation or uplift people or move people you know um if I'm moved by it um in in any way um that's usually a good sign sometimes mm -hmm. I will start reading I usually know if it's a good script if I start reading my character aloud while I'm yeah. reading it the first time like sometimes I'll you know I'll be reading it and then I find myself saying the words and I'm like oh I'm like I'm connecting with this so so that's usually that's usually a good sign as well that's a good um, tip <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. and this is a lovely question and an observation as well from from Tamara Hess who says as a queer person of color actress I want to say thank you for playing a role in highlighting our stories even if fiction Fictional is still very pivotal. There's a lot of love coming from my community to you. I have a lot of gratitude and respect mm -hmm. uh, for that. And I would like to know what it means to you to portray these characters. And um, she also adds, uh, I also have a lot of admiration and respect for you as an artist and actor. Thank you very much, Tamir. Oh, thank you. Well, th that's that means so much. I, I really, you know, I really appreciate that. And And for me, you know, I feel like, storytelling is storytelling and I th think that you know every community and every uh, everyone should see themselves represented on screen and and I think that you know for me with a story like San Junipero or um or, or Summerland perhaps you know those characters you know however they identify as queer bisexual or lesbian um you know that they are whole characters you know for me that is um really important and um and really i i just you know i love those projects and i and like any project that i i take on i just want to feel like it's being represented you know in a, mm. a three-dimensional way um so so yeah it's meaningful to me um there's a few people asking quite a similar question um mabali uh, an anonymous person and nola jordan um, Nola says, what's your dream role? Mahali says, given the opportunity, what is a story that you're dying to tell? <laughs> um, and the anonymous attendee says, if you could, um, actually it's a different one, so what, I'll get you to answer that one first. So yeah, so what's your dream role and given the opportunity, what's the story that you're dying to tell? Ooh. Dream role, I mean, I, you know, this sort of changes because so often I've been surprised by some of the roles that I have played that have been dream roles. I didn't, I didn't know about you know um but I've I've long wanted to play Cleopatra um that's nice. uh, I'm fascinated by from history and um having played small parts in in the Shakespeare version of Antony and Cleopatra sooner out of drama school I um yeah I just think that she's a fascinating character and and I think there's a lot more to her than maybe mm. we've seen um or we've seen more from the male gaze or from um you know a more sort of uh I don't know a simplified version of her and I'd love to sort of find find more nuances in Cleopatra um what was the other question I can't remember what is uh, the story? it, it, it it was if there's a story that needs to be told what's the story you want to tell but I guess mm. Cleopatra is that really isn't yeah it? I think so I mean um yeah I'm always looking for stories I'm always looking you know and reading and as I say coming you know thinking with my producer hat on now I'm always looking out for stories to tell so um yeah I don't know I'm very excited about that. Please make it happen. Um, and another anonymous attendee, I wish you would put your name in your questions, um, but, but anonymous attendee says, if you could reprise any TV character that you've portrayed and make a film about them, who would it be and why? Oh my God. Ah, I don't know. I mean, it would be fun to do a film of like San Junipero, but like from a different- Kelly. 
ang ang yeah. angle, you know, or a different period. I just think that that would be really enjoyable just because that was in my head just then. Um, mm. And I don't know. I, um, ooh, yeah, I probably, I'd probably say like the, something from the Black Mirror world because of how it dealt with time. I feel like it would be possible to maybe, you know, revisit it somehow. Or an origin story of Renslayer. <laughs> or an origin story of Renslayer. This is true. I mean, there's, yeah, there's, there's definitely lots of scope in the Marvel Universe for, uh, for films of those, those characters, for sure. Um, another anonymous attendee says, um, how did you enjoy being involved in the casting process for uh, The Girl Before? It was interesting. I mean, it was really, it's always strange, I think, as an actor when you've been on the other side of it for so so long auditioning you know to then um to then think about casting and and I think maybe as an actor I don't know if there's any actors out there but you know as an actor so often if you don't get a part you're thinking oh you know they didn't want me like or whatever and I, and I think the fascinating thing about being part of the casting process really made me appreciate that it's not just about talent you know there are so many talented people out there mm -hmm. and, and so often it's about fitting the pieces of the puzzle together, you know, and, the, and the, 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 the casting process is such an art form. It's not just about getting one great person for the role because they have to fit together, you know, the balance has yeah. to be right between the actors. And I think that that's something that I really came to appreciate, you know, being on this side of it, you know, it's not just about can you do the role or not, it's about what's the tone of the piece, what's the world of the piece and, and yeah. what's the chemistry between, between all of these characters to make a sort of cohesive world. So that's something I really learned. This is a great question. It's just come in, actually. What's your view on the British style of creating a sort of four to six episode show uh, versus the 20 episode shows we see from the States? Well, you know, I think that's changing even, even now. I mean, I think with streaming um, and the idea of a limited series as opposed to a, an ongoing series, um, for me, I probably am more drawn towards the sort of shorter form um, because, uh, you know, you can then maybe get more breadth in, you know, you're not, you're not tied to something in a sort of more procedural fashion that you can tell a story almost, and it feels almost like a long film, you know, and mm. I think that we're obviously seeing that not just in the UK, but, but in the States as well. And on streaming, I think, you know, that there's not really as much pressure to make 20, episodes of something because um you know it's not just airing on television now people can stream it whenever they want so so I feel like that's um been a great thing you know that, that maybe came from British television the shorter form format but is now being used all over all over the world and all over on streaming um and I think it helps that the quality stay high you know I think yeah. I prefer quality over quantity um uh, yeah. for me so yeah um, Ahmed says, um, how does your preparation and research differ between a real character uh, like Daido Bell or Jennifer compared to, to you know, a, a, an imaginative character like Judge Rensley? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's totally different, really. I, um, obviously, there's research that you can do um, on, on real characters and, you know, be it really spending time with them if you can or reading or watching documentaries or you know sort of saturating yourself in the world um I mean when it comes more to the Marvel world obviously it's much more of an imagine imaginative leap but there's still research you can do and there's there's mm -hmm. still um you know training that you can do in terms of the stunts and in terms of the more of the physicality you know it becomes a bit more that it's slightly less of a cerebral kind of research and more of a phys physical and also you know the sort of mythology of all the films and the worlds that has have come before and of course the comic books so mm. so you know there's 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 different approaches but um you know I think always whatever research you do it's just there to sort of give you confidence and 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 sort of back up your choices but at the end of the day you know acting is still an imaginative process you know however much research you do you have to still sort of give it heart um so so for me um it's nice to have different genres you know um because there's always you know something to learn yeah um going to put you on the spot with this question which says what's your favorite show right now and your top three movies of all time 
Oh my God. <laughs> um, my favorite show right now. I've been catching up because I was so busy last year. I didn't um I didn't get a chance to watch much TV. So I'm just catching up and I just really enjoyed um the White Lotus. Um oh, which, so good. Which, yeah, which I know everybody saw it months ago, but I was just you know catching up so so that was really cool again you know a genre a really interesting you know dark genre and I just found it so refreshing and the characters just fascinating so uh so that, so that's what I'm watching at the moment and wait what was the other part of the question top three movies of all time no pressure, oh, no pressure. I'll give you I'll give you I'll give you in no particular order so you can just <laughs> Um, one that I love just because it had such a huge impact on me when I saw it was, um, and I, I was a teenager, was, was Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. That was, that was huge for me because I was studying Romeo and Juliet at school and um, it was just, it really just reinvigorated Shakespeare for me. I just found it, you know, just, it just came at the perfect time for me. And I think it's a brilliant film and the way that music is used and, and the acting and just, just the whole concept of it um, was amazing. Um, another one I remember, oh my gosh, I've said this before, but it's like, it's, it's one of my favorite, it's an animation, um, which is uh, Up, my, my favorite oh. animation. <laughs> It's up there in my in my favorite films of all times. I could quote lines from it. I find it so uplifting and very moving. Um, and so good. That opening sequence, geez Louise, yeah. is one of the most emotional things. I've, I'm Isn't it? bawling Isn't my it? eyes out every I time. I know. And the music, I mean, the whole thing is just, oh. oh yeah. Epic, epic. <laughs> um, I can't remember. God, one more. I have to find one more of all time. Um, gosh, this is so difficult. Um, what about the last film you watched then? Yeah, the last film I watched, um, you know, I just really enjoyed uh, The Eyes of Tammy Faye um, with yeah. Chastain, um, which was just such an amazing performance. And um, and for me, that was, it was also just, you know, as a, an actor watching an actor, you know, such a, a big performance in a way, you know, in terms of the scale of, of the character, but it was so emotionally connected. And I thought, oh, it's not often that you see um, that kind of, uh, that combination where you can see, you know, there's a larger than life character, but it's also, as I say, grounded and, um, you know, just, just, it was just such a fun and and nuanced performance. Yeah. Um, and Chase has got the last question for us today. He says, uh, what upcoming projects can we look forward to? Um, yes. Well, um, obviously, apart from The Girl Before, uh, if you haven't seen it uh, or in America, um, then um, Surface will be the next thing, which is, you know, what I've been working on, um, which uh, I don't know when it will be out but it's on it's going to be on apple tv plus and that's um eight episodes and a completely original psychological um drama and uh yeah i'm so excited for people to see it it's, it's a, such a, a a different you know thing to anything i've done so yeah that'll be the next thing and you were involved behind the scenes as well with that one weren't you as well yes you were, yeah that's right yeah. yeah as uh executive producer and lead actor on that one too yeah amazing well we'll look <laughs> out for the announcement on that one but in the meantime make sure you go and check out and um, the girl before if you haven't already if you're in the uk it's on iplayer and it's going to be hitting the states uh first week of february and um, google it's so great to get to chat to you and just really celebrate you know this this it's just some of the work that you've done up to to this point i'm so excited to see you know what you, what you do in, in years to come and where that takes you and what you what you give us to enjoy so thank oh, you so much thank you edith and thank you for making this so much fun and um yeah this has just just been lovely and thank you to the royal television society thank you <laughs>